Welcome, everybody. Good to see a nice crowd. And we have, of course, one of my favorite people in the whole world, Annette Gordon-Reed. Mm -hmm. I think I remember running into you on a bridge once in Cambridge when you were bringing your kid to Harvard the first well, time. Well, yeah, I think we met before then. I know, I know, but I remember just seeing... But we meet in strange places. We meet in strange not, places. This is not a strange place. She's the Charles <laughs> Warren Professor of History at Harvard and um, also at Harvard Law School. Yes. So you got a dual appointment, which yes. is always smart. Mm -hmm. You know, can move back. <laughs> I asked Two why she did meetings. it, and she said, um, because the law school has better offices. <laughs> <laughs> They're air conditioned, I think, is what you said. Uh, she's famous, of course, uh, for her book, The Hemingses of Monticello, uh, which grew out of uh, Sally Hemings and American Controversy, which you had written about a decade earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition, you've done a new book with. Uh, co-author Peter Ornoff, which is Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of Imagination. All those books will be out there. You'll sign them, I hope, when oh, people sure. buy them. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very relevant conversation because one of the things I love about your writing is that you show how the ripples of history sort of come and then affect us today. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Sally Hemings and race and Jefferson and the American Creed. How did you get on to that? Well, I got onto it because I was interested in the way historians had written about the topic of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. And I had sort of noticed over the years that there was a double standard in the presentation of evidence that if a white upper class person said something, that was treated as if it were gospel fact. And if enslaved people told a different story, that was questioned, particularly if they were saying things that people didn't like. And it just struck me as sort of an odd situation where you had slavery, this institution that we see as a system of oppression, that historians would be taking the side of the people who were the oppressors or interested in protecting the images of the people who were the oppressors, rather than listening to the victims. We typically think when something has happened to a person, and there's no question that slavery was a system of oppression, you would look at enslaved people when they came out of that and said, this is what happened to me, to put, the, you know, to put them under, you know, give them the third degree and put them under the light and try to you know, question every single thing they said, but let the white people in the story off the hook when they were saying things that were patently ridiculous. Is this why for so long people um, denied that Sally Hemings' children were Thomas Jefferson's children? Well, that was part of it. The other part of it is that people didn't want to believe it. Well, certain people didn't want to believe it. I would say in the, in the black community when I was growing up, people talked about this as if it were something that were if it was true, you know, that it didn't strike them as strange because the idea of a slave owner having children with an enslaved woman it didn't seem like a, you know, a far-fetched idea, but it was always presented that way in the history books. How important was the DNA evidence in convincing people? Well, I think it was important. I mean, people had sort of moved around. A number of people had moved, changed positions before then, but the DNA has the imprimatur of science. And so that was something that was that aided people's understanding of it. So it isn't the DNA by itself doesn't tell the whole story. So between the combination of the DNA and the material that was printed in my book, uh, the Monticello Foundation, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, did their own study and came to the conclusion that you know the story was likely true. And so and Madison Hemings, the son, mm -hmm. the son of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson has his own oral history and things that he wrote, which became important pieces of evidence. Yes, well, it's, Madison Hemings is not properly oral history. I mean, he is, it's family history, but he was at Monticello, so he is a person just like Jefferson's grandchildren and you know, the people in his family, the legal family, talking about his life there at Monticello. He gave him um, an interview to a man named S.F. Wetmore in 1873 when he talks about being uh, the son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And if you read it, one of the most interesting things about it is the fact that he's sort of speaking in a very matter-of-fact 
way about this. He's talking about all these other kinds of details and things that are interesting in and of itself, but for people who are into the Tom and Sally thing, you're sort of saying, now tell us more about your mother and your father. And he is filling out his story in the way a person speaks, the way you or I would talk about but our But he lives. talks about it as, a, just as if it were a normal yeah, yeah, family. Yeah, it's a normal thing. Like, well, like a normal family. <laughs> your, fa your father's Thomas Jefferson is not going to be. <laughs> can't be quite normal, uh, particularly if he's you know, you're also legal owner. That's weird uh, from our eyes uh, today. But he's talking about them in a, in a very matter of fact way. He calls Sally Hemings, he refers to her as mother, and Jefferson his father, and this is what we did. And, and, and it was just sort of like a natural kind of thing. Uh, it's interesting because I see a lot of the people in my class right there. We often talk about agency, whether a person, like Lulu White we were talking about, who ran a, a bordello in New Orleans, a, a person of mixed race, mm -hmm. and whether or not she had the ability to control her own destiny or whether she was being oppressed. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about Sally Hemings is that she was a slave, but for a significant portion of time, she's not totally actually a slave because she's in Paris mm -hmm. with Thomas Jefferson and could be free since the writ of Virginia is not enforced necessarily in Paris. And so they kind of negotiate. Mm -hmm. So is she a person of free will who decided that this is what she wanted? Well, Walter, what is free will? <laughs> <laughs> We're not a philosophy course. We're a history no. course. <laughs> what is free will? Who's operating under free will? No, the point is that she is in Paris in the 1780s, and in Paris, every enslaved person who filed a freedom petition, it was granted. It was People didn't like the idea of having slaves in France. There are no slaves in France. They used to say that. They're all off in the colonies. But in <laughs> Paris, they did not like that. So she and her brother James, who was eight years older than she, uh, could have petitioned for their freedom and stayed in France. So it's a bit of a different situation than if she had been in Virginia or I, I, you know, with, with absolutely no power, with the law is not against you. The law is what made her an enslaved person. In Paris, she could have been a free person. So it's the law of France versus Thomas Jefferson, and we know that he was concerned about this because he wrote a letter to a man who had asked him about an enslaved boy, a little boy who he'd brought over. And Jefferson says, well, I know a person who brought a slave over from the United States. And if you don't say anything, and if they don't find out, then you know it's not going to be a problem. But if they find out, there's nothing you're going to do because you can do because the law is on their side. So, he thinks that they're pretty much free in France, and he actually pays them. And because of that, he pays them regular wages. And at first, I thought that these were sort of just nominal wages. But when I actually went back and did mm -hmm. research and looked at the scale of wages, they were paid yeah, at the high at end, the, at high end of, the, of the scale. So these are people, and he paid them every month. In France, you typically got paid at the end of the year, once a year. And he was paying them the American way. So they were getting money every month, a good amount of money. And they know that they, are, they have a chance for freedom. So it's very different from being a woman in Virginia uh, with absolute nothing and on her side. at what point, I'm going to use a word that Madison uses. Mm -hmm. Ma Madison um, Hemings, Hemings yeah. uses, not James Madison. So well, his you, name was James Madison Hemings. So yeah. there you, you think about Madison. No, but I'm going to use his <laughs> word. So forgive me the word if those don't like it. When does she become the concubine? He doesn't say, he doesn't give like on you know, July 4th, <laughs> 1789. No, um, he doesn't say precisely. He says, during that time, my mother became Mr. Jefferson's concubine. Now, they all called him Mr. Jefferson. His white family, I mean, it's a very formal time. And Mr. Jefferson was the way to describe it, Mr. Jefferson, or Mr. J, or alternately, father. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't say precisely when. But when she's about to go home, she is pregnant. That's 1789. And she doesn't want to go because she wants to, she would be re-enslaved. That's what uh, Madison Hemings says. And she evidently doesn't want her children to be slaves. 
because she extracts the promise from Jefferson that if she comes back with him, she would have a good life at Monticello and her children, their ch any children she had, would be freed when they were 21, when they were adults. And Jefferson doesn't have to abide by that promise, but he does. No, he doesn't, no, no, he doesn't at all. I mean, when she, once she's back in Virginia, he can do whatever the heck he wants to do, uh, but he does. Why on both sides? Why on both sides? Because do they love each other? Do they love each other? I was wondering if I was going to get out of here before you asked me that. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I have no problem. She could have been a completely lovable person from everything. I, I have no, but he, on the other hand, um, you know, I don't have any problem thinking that he was attached to her because this is 38 years of her in his life. Um, there are no stories about him with other women after he comes back. But once she gets to here, back to the United States, she's under his control. You know, she can't change her mind about anything. That was a huge, and it was something, a difficulty when I was writing my first book, because I struggled with this and thinking, now why would you come back here with him? Why would you do this? And it became much more clear to me when I was writing The Hemingses, and I began to think about her as a part of a web of relationships, her family. It's not just, Tom and Sally don't really make any sense, don't make as much sense by the, the, just the two of them. They're part of a web of relationships. Her mother, her brothers, her sisters, all of these people are back in Virginia. And that well, was a dilemma that- What's particularly complicated is that Sally is the half-sister of Thomas Jefferson's late wife. Exactly. Who was white. Yeah. They both had the same they had white the same father. father. Uh -huh. And I assume sort of looked alike. I've said. Well, we don't know what they look like. We don't, actually, we don't have a portrait of Jefferson's wife, which is sort of an odd thing for a woman of her class, mm -hmm. that we don't have a portrait of her. Um, but yes, John Wales, uh, an e English immigrant, was the father of Martha Wales, Jefferson's wife, and Sally Hemings. So that's another thing. I mean, he saw her and her brothers and sisters through the prism of their connection to his wife. This is not just someone, you know, random person. This is a person who was tied to his wife. And interestingly enough, when he marries her and when- When he marries- When he marries Martha, the only person he was married yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to make sure. Uh, when he marries Martha, uh, couldn't be married to Sally. He yeah. married Martha, uh, and John Wells dies and he inherits the Hemings family, she brings them to Monticello to be in the house, which is sort of an interesting thing to do. We don't really know that much about Martha, but I found it fascinating that unlike a lot of stories you hear about plantation mistresses whose fathers or sons or husbands had children with enslaved women and they sold them or they made them send them away, she brings them into the household the other thing, Sally Hemings' brothers, we don't know about Sally Hemings, could read and write. Mm -hmm. And you wonder who taught them to read and write. And James um, is the older brother. Uh, Robert is the eldest, and then there's James, and then Peter was, a, was the other. Sally was the youngest, Sarah was her name. So she installs them in her household. Jefferson had a manservant, a man named Jupiter Evans, whom he substitutes, he switches out and makes Robert his personal valet. He's, t he's 14 years old at the time. No, he's 12 at the time. And he's with Jefferson when he writes the Declaration in Philadelphia. So you think about this. This is like a family, a weird, wacko kind of family situation, perverse, if you want to use that term, coming together here with the siblings, the half-siblings, enslaved half-siblings, with Thomas and Martha. So when you think about how he views Sally Hemings, the connection to his wife, whom he you know, really loved and was devastated when she dies, is, is probably back there in the mix. He frees all of the Hemings family when he dies, mm. but no other slaves? No, he doesn't free all of the Hemings family. The Hemings family is huge at this point. No, I mean, all of the children. All of the people, all, all, all of the children, yeah. No, the two eldest children are not formally freed. They leave Monticello to live as white people. And they don't want freedom papers because if you have freedom papers, that means you were a slave, and which would mean that you were 
part so black. So they lived as white people and had white Hemings, Jefferson descendants mm -hmm. all the way through the 19th century. Yeah, the, the two eldest, uh, Beverly, which is a male, his name was William Beverly, and Harriet went to Washington and settled and they married white people. And we don't know anything about their descendants. The two youngest, Madison and Eston, lived for a time as black people in Ohio. Eston decides that life is becoming too difficult for black people in Ohio, and he moves to Madison, Wisconsin, changes his name to Eston Jefferson, E.H. Jefferson, and lives as a white person. So in the Virginia census, they are listed as Negro, but in the Wisconsin census, the, in they are and listed as white. When he changes white. his name to E.H. Jefferson, does he go under the premise that he is a descendant of Thomas Jefferson? They change their family story and say that they are descended from a Jefferson uncle because everybody knows that Jefferson had no legitimate sons. So they can't say, I'm the son of Thomas Jefferson. So they have to get rid of Sally mm -hmm. out of the family story and they have to get rid of Jefferson too. And you think about what it means to be white. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think, you're the son of Thomas Jefferson. And you don't want to say that you're the son of Thomas Jefferson because that means your children won't be able to vote. They won't be able to have an education. They'll be disrespected. They will be second class citizens. So they give all of that up for their children. That means they have to give up their mother and their other relatives. Madison stays in the black community. Some of his children pass for white and they kind of find each other in 1998 when the DNA comes out and people realize the connections. And when the, the DNA comes out, how does Monticello, the institution, not mm -hmm. just the house, but mm -hmm. the, uh, decide to cope with it in terms of the graves, in terms of... Well, the, the gra the Monticello, there, there are a th couple of things. The Monticello Association is the family association of Thomas and Martha Jefferson, descendants, and they don't recognize the Hemingses. The Thomas Jefferson Foundation that runs the house that many of you, many people may have here may have gone to, to see, they run the house and the other grounds. So they have nothing to do with the cemetery. And the cemetery, the only thing that the Monticello Association has is the right to be buried in the graveyard. Now, as far as I know, none of the Hemingses really wanted to be buried in the graveyard. This is sort of a fight. There was a fight, and no, I don't no. know how much of a big fight it was, but it was between um, the white descendants of Jefferson, uh, the legal white descendants of Jefferson. But um, the, the foundation sort of started out very, very tentatively saying, well, at least one of the children was the son of Tom, because they were sticking closely to the DNA. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make any sense, because he was the last kid. Yeah. It would be as if, it would be one thing if it were the first, but it would be like Jefferson at 65 yeah, says, say, oh, yeah, you know. Uh, faithful to the extent yeah, you can well, use that word well, faithful. to Sally. Well, but I mean, it, the, the point is that the, the youngest, he wouldn't have started this connection at that point when she had three kids by some other man. So it didn't make any sense. So now they have basically said, you know, all of her children, we believe historical evidence suggests not just the DNA, but all of the other stuff that's in my book and other places suggest that all of these kids belong to him. And so they put that out there and now they've sort of moved on to other things. A few months ago, Meacham was in that chair and I know you and he have worked together with the mm -hmm. Monticello crowd mm -hmm. to redo the way Monticello mm -hmm. shows things off. Mm -hmm. And that includes uh, having Sally as part of the story yeah, when you yeah. go. I mean, before there was, um, there's a plantation community tour, which they still do and which is great. But, and they always mention slavery in the house tour. But now they have a room where Sally Hemings lived for a time. That's the difficult thing about interpreting a plantation. You have to pick a particular moment Monticello, the story there is over 50 years, but they pick a time when she was living there and they do an exhibit of Sally Hemings and that's part of the regular tour. So she's front and center there now. Um, I read your latest book, the mm -hmm. one you did with Peter, The Empire of Imagination. And you seem to have become, over the course of your studies, more, not less, sympathetic to Jefferson. Is that right? 
I would say so. And I think it's probably because I've gotten older. <laughs> and well, you know, you, you look back over your life and you think of all the things that you wanted to do that I just don't have time to do. Mm -hmm. And in other words, a certain humility that we're a all humility. flawed. Yeah, we're, we're all flawed. And from his perspective, when he's writing these letters that exasperate us, when he's telling Edward Coles, you know, the young man who wants to leave Virginia and go to Indiana, he actually does, and free his slaves. I mean, he kind of ends up on a Jeffersonian trajectory as an older man, but he ha he's doing the right thing. And Jefferson is saying, no, stay here in Virginia and fight. The next generation of people will do this, and we keep the impatience, we keep saying, why don't you do something? Well, if I could imagine Jefferson saying, look, I helped found a country. I wrote the Declaration of Independence. I broke away from Great Britain. I bought Louisiana. I Which, was, thank you. Know, best, thank you. I bought, <laughs> I, you know, I did all of these things, and now you're saying, and I didn't end slavery? And, and I think about what have I done? You mm -hmm. know, I, I no, seriously, I mean, you know, what have I done? I mean, I, I have a law degree, mm -hmm. and I could be out working in the law, helping to right some of the wrongs that are being done under law. I'm trained to do that, and what am I doing? I'm writing about people who lived mm -hmm. 200 years ago. And why? Um, because I think this is something that I'm good at doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how good I would be. I could do it. I could do law. I could do that. Um, but I don't think I would find what I'm supposed to be, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing in that But arena. that humility you talked about, that leads you into what seems like it must be a difficult balance yeah. <laughs> of judging people like a Jefferson or Robert E. Lee or anybody else by the standards of their time, mm -hmm. but also putting a light, sort of saying, these were people mm -hmm. who ended up being ahead of their times when it comes to what we now think of mm -hmm. as moral uh, approach. Yeah, well, you, I mean, you're dealing with a person and a biographer, uh, when you're doing, when you're writing about a person, uh, there has to be a certain level, the balance, as you said, empathy without falling into excuse making, mm -hmm. you know, or, or without, falling into condemnation. There are people who write biographies. They write hate biographies, you know? Like hate watch things. Mm -hmm. People write hate biographies. The people they hate and they want to write about them to express that. And that's not good, nor is love. The idea that you admire somebody and you're constantly, I mean, Duma Malone wrote a six volume biography of Jefferson and he is the person that you have to consult when you're writing about Jefferson. And the Virginian, Jefferson the Virginian is the first volume. By the time he gets to the sixth volume, The Sage of Monticello, he is not as worshipful as he was at the very beginning because he realizes he's dealing with somebody who's much more complicated than he thought he was, much more interesting, actually, than the person in the first volume. And he's constantly making everything is somebody else's fault. It's not Jefferson's fault, it's someone else. Um, but it's a much more balanced portrayal at the end. And it's, there's no magic formula to it. It's just, it's like, it's like cooking or something like that, where you, you a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. You can't, you know, you just, the alchemy of it is not clear at the time, but you have to find that balance and realize you're writing about a person, not a statue, not a god, or not the devil. It's a human being, and you're trying to explicate that life. And that's, it's a difficult thing to do, and it can be done, and some people are really good at it, and I've tried, I've tried to be. And one of the things you do, and I try to teach my students a bit, which is when in doubt, complexify. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. it's actually always pretty complex. Mm -hmm. A guy who can write that sentence that begins, we hold these truths, mm -hmm. that all men are created equal, and do it while he's got mm -hmm. that 14-year-old slave mm -hmm. as his mm -hmm. valet standing with him in Philadelphia. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's the world he was born into. And it's very, a lot of people don't move very far from the world they're born into. Mm -hmm. but, and if not even physically, the values that people have, the reactions, the responses to things. And, you know, he, there were, there were people who were born in his time who never questioned 
slavery at all. Um, and he questioned it, didn't do anything about it. Well, didn't, I mean, mm -hmm. he tried to do some things about it, realized that his countrymen, and that would be Virginians, were not gonna vote slavery out of existence. And then he turned to the thing that was his life's work, which he thought was the American Revolution and the creation of the United States of America. That's the thing, we're interested in race and slavery, and we should be. And we could say he should have been, but at the time, he was interested in the American experiment, and what galvanized him was his role in that. That's what he thought was gonna be his legacy, that's why he would be a figure of history, because he created a country that he thought, he kind of really believed in American exceptionalism, that was supposed to be a beacon for the world, and he thought, we've done this, and this is my contribution. The other things, other people will take care of. And let's get it how it ripples to today, because you spent a lot of time in Charlottesville, mm -hmm. especially after in, uh, the Charlottesville incident. There are people who are white nationalists mm -hmm. who are rallying around the Jefferson statue there, mm -hmm. and there are people who are on the other side mm -hmm. trying to invoke Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you feel when you look at a Jefferson statue there, a monument, mm -hmm. and how each side tried to appropriate it? Well, it's fascinating because the, the white nationalists are there because, well, Charlottesville is a symbol of, before then, sort of a, a place of tolerance. Universities, people think of mm. universities as places of inquiry and free inquiry and tolerance and so forth. Different races of people, different religions, everybody coming together. And Jefferson, in Notes on the State of Virginia, the only book that he ever wrote, expresses the view that was held by a number of people, um, Marshall, Madison, Lincoln for a time, that whites and blacks probably could not live together in peace and harmony. We had to have emancipation, but blacks had to have their own country. And it could be in the West at first, and then no, it could be some other place. But there was no way for the races to live in harmony because white people would never give up their prejudices and black people would never forgive white people for what had been done. And he says in the notes, how can you, have, how can you love a country that has treated, that's treated you the way the country has treated black people? So he says, this is not gonna work. There's gonna be race riots and fighting. And you know, we condemn that, but the truth of the matter is, there's been sort of a war, a cold war and a hot war. If you think of lynching, you think of Jim Crow, this hasn't been easy. Mm -hmm. So the people on the, who were carrying the torches were channeling that kind of Jefferson. The people who were around the statue, who may not be, you know, not championing Jefferson, but the ideals of Jefferson in the Declaration, think about we hold these truths to be self-evident and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those kinds of things that every group in America that seeks a place in America has <laughs> And they were at a, at a, at a log, loggerheads there because of the symbol. Could the um, statue of Jefferson remain? In the University of Virginia? Yeah. <laughs> he founded the University yeah. of Virginia. I mean, that would be, that's like, mm -hmm. that's Soviet. Could a statue of Robert E. Lee be at Washington and Lee? A statue of Robert E. Lee in his civilian garb? which is what I think they've decided. Maybe they left the portrait up. Yeah, if, if, as long as it's Washington and Lee, I mean, either they get rid of the name and go whole hog, or a statue of him as a civilian, as the you know, progenitor of this place, sure. And I don't know if you followed the controversy in this city, but would you have been in favor of taking down the statue of Robert E. Lee yes. in Confederate yeah. uniform at Lee Circle here? Yes. Why? because he was a Confederate. Mm -hmm. And the Confederates lost the war. And the values of the Confederacy were defeated. And we don't, most of us, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, ideas, the ideals of the Confederacy, if you read their founding documents, Alexander Stevens, if you read the Constitution that they wrote, mm -hmm. this is founded on African inferiority, that African people are to be enslaved. I don't see how those values can hold true that we can sort of uphold those values in today's world. And 
it's not that people say you're destroying history. We're always going to talk about the Confederacy and Robert E. Lee in history, in history books. They'll, it will always be there. But public monuments um, are, they serve a different function. And I just don't see the purpose of that. Um, and, you know, I, they, Lee led armies that killed soldiers, American soldiers, people carrying the American flag. I, I don't understand why he would remain. And um, when you see what's happening today mm -hmm. in sort of what we could call the cycles of American history, mm -hmm. advances, backlashes, advances, backlashes, America can be conceived of in different ways. One is as a country founded on a creed, mm -hmm. not on an ethnic group, not on a nation state type thing, but on a creed that anybody who comes here who subscribes to this creed becomes an American. Mm -hmm. And the narrative of American history has often been, in fits and starts, we include more people into these all are created equal mm -hmm. concept. Uh, but then it's fits and starts. We have reactions. What causes those reactions? And we seem to be, at least nationally, in a reaction period uh, to inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And are these things that are just passing cycles? Well, they're passing cycles. We're in a moment now that probably is in reaction to having had a black president, um, having entered a world where people are concerned about the future, about jobs, about how if there's enough of a pie. The times that things have expanded, I don't think that there's any, any coincidence that if you think of the 50s and the 60s with the civil rights movement, when the American economy, the post-war economy was booming and you know, people were hopeful and optimistic, we also were fighting um, an evil empire, what people had constructed as an evil empire. The Soviet Union was offering nations that were coming out of colonialism a model. You know, in Africa and other places, do, do we go with the West, Western view or do we go with the other view? And so there were reasons for, uh, for people to pay attention to what was going on. How could we say, how could we present ourselves as a beacon to the world when there were, when the, the lunch counters were segregated? When, when I was a little kid, and this was even after, you know, after Brown, you know, we sat in the balcony when we went to the movie. When I went to the doctor's office, there was a, a separate rating room for us and other people. How do you tell countries that are coming out of colonialism, oh, come over and be like us when you had all of this kind of stuff going on? So there were specific global things that were happening in the world and things that were happening domestically, that is to say things that were, people were optimistic, that really don't obtain now. We don't have a real rival, we have fake rivals that people are being made into rivals, but not anybody mm -hmm. that's in contentious with us, content, really contention with us at this point. And people are concerned about the pie, a shrinking pie. And when you have that, you can't be magnanimous about people who aren't, that you don't see as being in your family, mm -hmm. aren't a, a part of your people. And so it's a really, you know, it's a, it's a difficult time. And this is not just here. If you look around the world, um, the similar kinds of things are happening. The, it, people are, are feeling in a restrictive mode, restrictive mood, I should say. More nationalistic. Yeah, more and, nationalistic. Uh, let me open it up. Um, and I'm having a little trouble seeing, but yes, is that Jason? <laughs> hey, Jason. <laughs> Mr. Pre President of our city council, Jason Hello, Williams. Man. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, would you describe um, Jefferson's conflict as internal? On, on race, racism, and slavery, or more of an external rationalization of his choices? W where would you see him falling further to? Well, I know he considered himself to be a man of the Enlightenment. Even before he becomes a public figure, where there's a, he writes in his common that, I think, in his mid-20s, um, he copies out a poem about the slave trade, about the evils of the slave trade and by a man named William Shinstone. And this is before he's Thomas Jefferson, before there's a country, before he even knows he's gonna be involved in this. So he thinks that 
being anti-slavery, um, anti-clerical, anti-organ, well, skeptical of organized religion, belief in science, those are the kinds of tenets of enlightened people. So you take on you know, a sort of political philosophy that you have, and when you begin to apply it, some of those things you can apply, and some of them you can't. It's, a part, it's sort of the toolkits of the liberal mindset, and I don't mean liberal in the way we think of it, but maybe I do. Uh, but when it comes to actually walking the walk, it's hard to do. Um, he could not have had the life that he had at Monticello if slavery was gone. He also could not confront his neighbors in a real political way and make himself a pariah. He was a part of a community. And this is a difficult thing when we've had, the other thing that's happened when we've had advances is when white people confront other white people on black people's behalf. That's a hard thing to do because you're talking about your mother, your friends, your family, you make yourself an outcast. And the religion part, which he kept very, very secret, his, his, um, he wasn't an atheist, but he didn't believe Jesus was divine. He thought Jesus was just a good guy and you should follow the teachings of Jesus, but there were no miracles. He made his own Bible. He cut, cut up the Bible. He cut out all of the, he cut up the Bible and Famously. cut up the Bible and cut out all of the miracles because he thought those were things that were just added and that Jesus never said that he did. And he created his own Bible. And this Bible actually was given out, used to be given out to members of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. It was sort of an ecumen, you can tell you how times have changed. It was an, ecumen <laughs> an ecumenical Bible, Jesus with all the good things, you know, love your neighbor, all that kind of stuff. So those things he could do. Now the political stuff, he was willing to go whole hog on. Get rid of the king, you know, American Revolution, all that kind of stuff. So this is a long answer to your story. I think it's, it, I don't think that he's struggling, it's just that he, there was sort of an intellectual thing that this is the right thing to do, but actually doing it was hard. And I think that we're, as human beings, we all have those things. Yeah, Carla. Oh, oh my, he was, he was. Another hey, yeah. of my students. Um, you had mentioned that uh, Jefferson sort of, or that your sympathy arose when you had realized that he was really more wholly focused on his vision of founding this sort of American experiment. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on um, documents or institutions, especially at the very beginning of the founding of this country, that didn't just ignore slavery uh, in lieu of the, of the American experiment, but were, whose words and, and designs were very carefully chosen to perpetuate slavery and to perpetuate that stuff. So I'm just wondering what, you know, uh, they're not, uh, or that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, the American experiment and perpetuating slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I was thinking when Jefferson's ideas about the Declaration, about sort of a universal statement about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is one thing. The Constitution, which he was not involved in creating, um, other than to suggest that there be a Bill of Rights, does protect slavery. And that was a compromise. And it was a compromise that people said, you know, we'll get this together. And nobody at the time thought, well, I would say, most of the founding generation believed that slavery was an institution that was gonna die off. That it was something that was retrograde. And one of those things like we say, oh, you know, in the future we would have discovered how to do this thing or we would have changed. But at the particular moment, the idea was to keep all of the colonies together. And that compromise, and just as I said with Jefferson saying, well, I've started a country, you guys handle this other thing here, without realizing it was that thing that was gonna destroy the Union. It's, it's not until he gets to Missouri, eight in the Missouri crisis, 1819 to 21, that he begins to realize, and he actually has a famous letter about this was a fire bell in the night, that this is the rock upon which the Union would be split, that people actually would go to war over slavery. And so you're right, I mean, I think the American experiment definitely, with the Constitution, protected slavery, but at the time, people thought it was gonna be contained within where they were, and where slavery existed, 
and that it would eventually, free labor obviously is the most progressive thing, they would say, but we know that that's not what happens. He buys Louisiana, and then there's already slavery here when he buys it, but with the, the advent of cotton and sugar, slave prices go up and up and up, and it's not a retrograde institution. It's an institution that was profitable. Yeah, uh, right here, and then the president. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I guess I have a simple question. Uh, Sally Hemings father's name was Wales. Why didn't she accept that, or why wasn't her last name given to her as Wales? Because they took the last, I don't know, they kept the last name of Captain Hemings, who was, her father, her mother was a woman named Elizabeth Hemings, and she was the daughter of a white man named Hemings, and they just kept that. He recognized his daughter. John Wales did not recognize his children. So it's like when a woman, if there's no, well, obviously they couldn't have been married, but enslaved people, many of them did have last names. Most of them did have last names. Their, their masters just never wrote them. But sometimes they took the name of their father and other times they didn't. Sally Hemings just kept the name that her, her grandfather's name as opposed to John Wales' name. It was her mother's name too. It was her mother's name. And her mother was a slave. Her mother was a slave. Her mother was the daughter of an African woman and an Englishman. Mm -hmm. It was complex as we say. Um, Oh, sorry, now Blake and then President Fitz. You just lost your job a bit because you <laughs> jumped in ahead of the president of the university. He's the boss. Blake is a great <laughs> Civil War and uh, historian here at Tulane. I'm really curious about notes because it's like the, it's my favorite document in American history. Um, and I'm wondering if it kind of can uh, draw something else out from you about judging Jefferson I think it's very popular in the academy now, like teaching graduate students, but he's a rapist. You know, he's a, he's a racist, he's a rapist. It doesn't really matter which title you're using or which epithet. Um, but the thing that notes seems to invite that kind of, he's like the one guy who was just wrestling with this stuff, who was saying like, I mean, that document is filled with racist, you know, just generic racist stuff. They smell bad, they sweat too much, they are lustful after women, whatever. But then it's also filled with this stuff like there's going to be a revolution in the Wheel of Fortune, and if God is just, he's gonna, he's gonna we're screwed. I mean, that's the self-awareness there to me invites more judgment. If he was just purely racist and he had, had this <laughs> concubine, I would be like, all right, Jefferson's an asshole. But there's something <laughs> about that. That well, yeah, it's it's the it, the fact that he's talking about it, which is anybody who's been, I you know, the Supreme Court nominees understand that if you have a paper trail, um, that's a problem. And not just that, or even people who are applying for a job in, in, in the academy. If you have a bunch of articles that people can read and knock down, that's, that's a problem for you. He is talking about these things and thinking about these things in ways that other people aren't. But it cannot be the case that Thomas Jefferson was the only person who thought that white people look better than black people or that white people were smarter than black people. He's saying things that, that his country, he, just as the declaration he says he's expressing the mind of his community, he he's expressing the mind of his community and he would be stunned because what frightened him about the notes were the passages against slavery because he thought that his fellow Virginians would read those and then he would become a pariah. But that's not it. He doesn't know that you know, a couple hundred years later, we're gonna be looking at his, basically come from Edward Long, the, um, the, the history of Jamaica. Uh, all of these things about black people and orangutan, all this kind of stuff comes from that. You can sort of know who he's read last um, by reading some of his stuff. Um, he's being Mr. Science. And he doesn't realize that those passages are the, gonna be the things that we fixate on and not the other stuff about slavery. So you're right, if you venture into this territory, if you thought that he, he was completely lost, you know, there was, was one of these people, you know, slavery is good, you know, black people deserve to be slaves, all of that, then you wouldn't judge him. But because you know he knows better, or he seems to know better, he gets much more of a, gets whacked on the head more. 
And that's more about, I mean, that's human nature. You know, why, why would you be angrier at the, I guess you're angrier because you think that you should be strong enough to let the good side of you triumph over the bad as opposed to just being all bad. <laughs> also those wor I mean, the words he wrote at first, like they're the whole reason we're here, right? Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't care about him if he didn't write all men are created equal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we would just be like, oh, he's just another racist Southern. Yeah, yeah. Good for him. Yeah. So no, it's, it's the duality of him that makes him interesting, but it's the duality that makes the country interesting in a way, because it's the same one, you know? I mean, it's, it's the, the high ideals with the dispiriting reality that's there. That's a really interesting concept is that the duality of Jefferson is also the duality of this country. And it's what we still wrestle with, both mm -hmm. with Jefferson and ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, President Fitz? Um, I want to ask you, uh, you've talked a lot about the important history here. I want to um, press you a little bit on historiography. Okay. Why did it take so long to, for, in a sense, someone like yourself to, in a sense, write this history? Um, and what, what about the history profession, in a sense, kept a blind eye to this topic, do you think? Well, and then, what do you think, once you had, in a sense, written this, how did it change other aspects of the views of Jefferson and historiography afterward? Well, Von Brody was the first person to write about Sally Hemings as if it, the story were true. Uh, in her biography of Thomas Jefferson in 1974. She was at UCLA and she was absolutely excoriated. The book became a bestseller. I don't think it's ever been out of print. Um, but people rejected it. The historical community rejected it. I think things had begun to change in their attitudes, people's attitudes about Jefferson and the founders in the 80s and the 90s. There was a conference at Charlottesville by, put on by my uh, co-author, Peter Onuf, um, Jeffersonian Legacies. And that was a conference where people were sort of reassessing, re-examining Jefferson as a figure altogether. So I think by the time I came along, people were ready, people in the historical community, because I don't think people in the, the public had no problem with this. I mean, Judging from the reception of Fawn Brody's book, there was a novel, Sally Hemings, by a woman named Barbara Chase Rebu, that was, you know, so <laughs> and um, a couple of million copies worldwide. So the, the public had no problem with this. It was really the historical community. Remember Jefferson biographers who, back to this thing I said before about loving a subject too much, mm -hmm had a real identification with him, and it was sort of, Jefferson wouldn't do anything that I wouldn't do, <laughs> and I wouldn't do that, and so therefore it wasn't done. And there's also authority about who gets to say what is true. I mean, Fawn Brody was subjected to a lot of sort of condescension. They referred to her as Mrs. Brody, never Professor Brody, and oh, that's that woman romance stuff. That's this romantic tale that these women are telling. And then, you know, your, my book challenged a group of white men. The book consists of me basically saying, ticking off, <laughs> check it off, and he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he doesn't know what he's talking about, and I did that without having to say yes, and there's some black people who don't know things too. I mean, there was none of that. It was just all, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And that was a, a tough for some people to take. So I think it's, it's about who gets to pronounce truth, and if we rely, and uh, Fawn Brody relied, she used Madison Hemings' recollections and the recollections of another man uh, who corroborated what Madison Hemings said. And the idea that you could set the terms of life about a great man like Jefferson listening to black people was just crazy to some people. You know, that you couldn't, you had to have the words of a number of white people vouching for this, saying that this was true, taking black evidence as truth was tough for people about something that mattered, about little things. If they were saying that Jefferson you know, sang well, 
um, was, you know, was a good horseman or things like that, that's okay. But if you say Jefferson was the father of these children, that's, you're giving too much power to people who were powerless. But by the way, didn't people at the time know he was a father of those children? Well, a lot of people did. I mean, you know, uh, his friends wrote their letters where they yeah. write about it, and uh, diaries where they refer mm -hmm. to this. Um, people knew the children's names, knew them in seriatim, and it was something that was thought of as just, you know, taken for a given because it was not that unusual. It was not at that, that unusual time. at that time, and in his and his particular place, it just was not that unusual. Especially in that family where it happened. That family quite that often. happened in that area, in the Charl in that particular area. People are doing research now on wills um, in Albemarle County, and they're finding lots of wills where, you know, they're not saying this is my, these are my children, but they're freeing a, yeah. a, a woman and her four mulatto children, yeah. you know, over and over, and giving them land and so forth. And that's not just, so this is something that was common, and I don't think historians, I would say many historians, did not want to believe that. And Rocco, you say um, they knew the names, like James Madison oh. Hemings. Who named him James Madison Hemings? Well, he says that Dolly Madison asked his mother to name him after James Madison Hemings. And Dolly? And she would give her a present. And he said, but she never gave my mother a present. That's how he says that, which is pretty funny. Well, we kind of liked Dolly Madison yeah, up until but, but now. That's, yeah. Until now, until now. I did too, until then. Well, but, I knew, I mean, the I knew kids, that tale without the fact that she didn't no, give the No, but the other thing. kids, you know, are all named for his best friends and his favorite, favorite relatives. I mean, I was sitting at New York Law School <laughs> at like three o'clock in the morning, one morning when I was working on my first book. And I thought, these, these are interesting names here. Who, who are these people? And I sort of pulled out this family tree, a Randolph family tree, and I saw, well, there's Thomas Eston, the youngest one, Eston, William Beverly, uh, Harriet, mm -hmm. James Madison, and uh, Thomas Eston. And Harriet, all those names are on Jefferson's. So Jefferson tree. named the children. I'm presuming he did, because all of the other Hemings family, members of the Hemings family, named their children after their siblings. Sally Hemings is the only one of them who did not get to name any of her children for anybody in her family. She had a bunch of brothers to name them for, but she didn't. They're all Randolph family names, and they're all connected to Jefferson. I'm sorry, yes. I was always saddened. I'll get you next, yeah. He did not free his slaves at his death. And uh, if you could just mention that. And could it have been that he was impoverished and was worried about money to other heirs? Well, no, he didn't free his slaves upon his death. He died bankrupt. And so he couldn't have freed his slaves because the creditors would have taken them, taken them back. Um, but I don't think he would have freed his slaves even if he could, all of them, at, upon his death. Um, first place, he had children. He had a daughter, a living daughter, and a bunch of grandchildren, and her husband had failed as a planter. They were actually living at Monticello. So they didn't have any money. And I don't think he would have freed all of his slaves, taken them away from Martha, who I think was the most important person in his life, his daughter, uh, his eldest daughter with his wife. Um, so he couldn't have freed them if he wanted to because he was bankrupt. He freed, he had to, they had to talk to creditors to allow him to free a certain group of people, a small number of people but um, they were not freed upon his death. It's a very small, interesting, we won't go into it, sidelight of history that Ben Franklin talks about a lot, is how did Jefferson squander so much money? I mean, he buys huge well, amounts wait a minute, of wine. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Franklin brought a bunch of stuff back from France. I know, but he said he couldn't keep up with <laughs> wait, Jefferson. No, Jefferson. No, 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 no. They were gonna, he, they told Franklin Jefferson. Franklin didn't die in debt. They told him, yeah, he died in 1790. He died before there was a recession, the first recession okay. in America. And We fall in love with our subject. Yeah, we fall in love. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, yes, ma'am. It was very along the same lines that that subject is so much. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
more as a historian who is affirmed through DNA, right? So you make your arguments way before the science comes out and then there's the science and then, then it's validated. And so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit like how that I told you so moment felt <laughs> in terms of having that affirmation. Well, you know, it felt good and bad because I, my goal all along was to have people look at, to say you can answer this question with our minds. You can answer our question, this question with observations. We have evidence. We have evidence, we have corroboration. We have all the normal things that you use to make decisions about things every single day, and it's all there. So on one hand, it was nice to be validated. On the other hand, you know, I, everything can't be put up to DNA. And the, I understand the faith in it and all, but we can, we can use our minds to answer questions. So it felt good. I mean, it felt good. It was interesting waiting the year for it, though. <laughs> you know, uh, because I, I'd given us talk in Charlottesville, and this woman raised her hand and said, well, we're going to have an answer to this anyway. And I said, oh, yeah, how are you going to do that? And she said, DNA. And I found out later they really hadn't figured on how they were going to do it that that was theoretical. But then they came up with this Y chromosome uh, was finally, that technology was finally confirmed. It's pretty simple. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not super, super complicated at all. And I got a call one night, I was cooking dinner, and I got a call from a newspaper who I'm sure remained nameless. Uh, the reporter said, what would you say if the DNA, if I told you the DNA was back and it found this? And I said, oh, okay, well, I'd say this. Well, she said, but it's not back yet, but what if you would say if it came if it were that? And I said, oh, then I would say this. And I hung up and I kept cooking. And the next day, I got a call from a friend of mine saying the DNA is back. And um, I said, oh, yeah, well, what is it? And then they told me uh, what it was, that there was a connection yeah. to Jefferson and Hemings, no connection to the Carr family, which is what, the fam what Jefferson's family had said and no connection to the Woodson family, which I had said and had borne the wrath of members of the Woodson family um, for a while. So I felt justified, but a little annoyed because, you know, you can answer this. The, the Woodson question could be answered, the Carr question could be answered, the Hemings question could be answered without science, I thought, but I was glad it was on my side. A little anecdote on science when it happens to Einstein. Mm -hmm which is he has his general theory of relativity. They decide whether to confirm, how to confirm it by looking at light mm -hmm. during an eclipse. Mm -hmm. And when um, it turns out he's right, somebody says to him, what would you have said had it turned out that it wasn't evidence? He said, I would have felt sorry for the good Lord because the theory is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you could have felt Dr. that I way. Feel sorry for them. <laughs> For the, uh, yes, there, was that? Will you, yeah, we'll make, yeah, one more. Um, I, I love the, in your book how you, um, I think it's called Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, I'm not sure, but it's, mm -hmm. you devote a chapter to Madison Hemings and to. Oh yeah, the first one, yeah. It's great, I love how you, um, and you talk a lot about the, the attitudes and the resistance to the story. And I'm writing about my great, great, great grandfather who had, children with a slave, he had three children, freed the woman and the slaves, this is in the early 1800s, and sent them north and continued a relationship with them, supporting them in different states, and they kept his name. Um, so it, it's very um, difficult to uh, decide, or decide what I think about the relationship, um, and you know, so, in Ned Sublett's book, he it says, well, slavery was rape, and anything like this was rape. And, you know, I just wonder if you could talk about the, their relationship, because when they have more than one child, or and they have seemingly a relationship, you know, how do you talk about it? It's, it's really hard. It's very, very tough to talk about it, because people are concerned, rightly so, about rape, the rape of African-American women in slavery. Um, that rape was endemic to the system. At the same time, I talk about it in the Hemingses by giving three examples. Sally Hemings and 
Celia, a woman in, um, in Missouri, who killed her master after years of, I think maybe two or three years of rape, of sexual abuse. And she he says he's going to come to her cabin. And you know he kills her. I mean, she kills him and burns him up in the fireplace with the aid of another person. And then the next day, asks his grandson to help dispose of the ashes that are in her, her chimney. So, I mean, she's made it clear what she thinks about him, um, no, without a doubt. And then there's Sally Hemings' sister who asks Jefferson to sell her to a man named Thomas Bell who lives on Main Street in Charlottesville. And Jefferson's, and they have children together. They live on Main Street. She takes his last name. He never frees her. He frees the children, but he leaves her and all of them the property and the house. And members of the community accept that, and his family accepts that, even though it's not possible for you to leave property to a slave because you couldn't take it. But the law works when the community, the way the community lets it work. And they knew who she was, and they treated her as if she were his common law wife. And, and reminiscences of the town later in the, in the 19th century referred to her as a common law wife, even though she, can't, she couldn't have been a real wife and she couldn't have been a common law wife. So what do you do with that? She's not like Celia to say, I want to go live with this man. And you know, he owned her just the way Robert Newsom owned Celia. But as a historian, I can't look at that and say, those two things are the same because they're different. They're, but I don't know, they don't fit our standard of the way people should act or the world, you know, they're not the world that we want to be in. But those two things are different. Sally is ambiguous um, because, well, for one thing, she's younger than Mary, her sister, when this started. Um, she was free in France. Um, she could have taken her freedom in France. But she's 16 years old, right? And a 16-year-old, well, 16-year-olds then are not like 16-year-olds now. But, um, you know, it's, you have to think, I put those there to get people to think that it cannot be possible that from 1619 to 1865, no white man and black woman actually liked each other. That's not, I mean, you know, I, it's just not possible. But politically, that's a difficult thing to say. And it's history, this is the thing. I mean, there's the political side that you could write all this stuff without doing any research. Mm -hmm. If you have a political viewpoint, uh, uh, and what I mean, if you have a, a theory about these things, you don't have to go to the archives. But if I go to the archives and I see someone acting in a particular way that's different than another person, I can't say they're all the same. You know, I'm, that would be an easy thing to do. Um, but you're right, it's so hard because there are people who say, look, it's, you know, as long as you, the master-slave relationship is such that there can be no consent. There can be no consent. But if I see, but then I'm saying the law determines how we feel about people. If the law tells you you can't marry, that means you can't love each other because the law says it. And that's just not the way the world, that isn't how it works. So you want to be mindful of rape because that's endemic to the system and it has been in every slave system. But if I'm looking at individuals and I see different things, I, as a historian, I have to treat it, I have to point that out and say maybe something else is going on here. I don't know exactly what it is, but you know, it's different. A marriage, a marriage for example, Marriage, there was no such thing as marital rape, right, until the 1980s. A husband could not rape his wife because marriage is perpetual consent. So a husband could force a wife to have sex. Now, I know that that's not the situation in most marriages, but surely there were some marriages where, or Jefferson's granddaughter, who married a man who beat her all the time. Jefferson said he thought, she would die at his hands. It's hard for me to imagine that she actually welcomed him. And, but she keeps having kids with him, even though he's chasing her around Monticello and beating the hell out of her. Um, but the marriage makes all of that clean. It makes the consent clear. So you have but to on get the my, flip side, mm -hmm. the slavery doesn't make it clear either mm -hmm. whether or not there was 
a real relationship, a real consent. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to look at the circumstances, but you don't, I know what people are scared of. Uh, moonlight and magnolias, as they call it. You know, oh, Tom and Sally living and loving in Monticello. Um, and you don't want that. You want to be clear about this stuff, but you do have to pay attention to details. Thank you. And you, did you get criticism from like critical race theorists and others to say, oh, by calling it a real relationship, by using sometimes words like mistress, mm -hmm. uh, you were too sympathetic to both of them? Well, I mean, I got, I've got some of that, but not as much as the blowback from the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, mistress arguing about mistress and um, concubine or whatever, I mean, I, I use those interchangeably um, because Madison Hemings describes her as a concubine. Their son describes that and try to unpack in the book what that actually means at the, at, in the 19th century. But yeah, um, there are people who are critical about various aspects of it. One, one last question to, uh, on monuments of the present. You and I walked from my apartment yesterday afternoon to the river and we walked through Jackson Square and we went around the statue of Jackson mm -hmm. um, with the Union must and shall be preserved, mm -hmm. carved on it by General Butler. Do you think that monument should be removed? Why are you bringing me into this controversy? <laughs> I want you to tell us history it's, is complex. It's, 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 the issue is complicated. It's <laughs> complex because it's the Battle of New Orleans, for heaven's sakes. And I mean, he saves New Orleans. And you know, he's a terrible, terrible person. But <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible man. But I would be inclined to have it there, but explain the ways in which he's a terrible, terrible person. Well, what you've taught us is that history is complex, and the reason it's complex is it's made by human beings. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you.